Hello and thanks for joining us on Encore. Coming up on today's show, Paris's opera ballet could be set for a shake-up as artistic director Benjamin Milpied may be on his way out after just over a year heading up the company. Chinese artist Ai Weiwei takes on the refugee crisis with a bold and provocative new piece. And we take a peek at Paris's lesser-known corners as a new kind of tour uncovers the hidden gems of the French capital. Big changes could be afoot at the prestigious Paris Opera Ballet. French choreographer Benjamin Milpied arrived in 2014 to direct the dance company. Now he might well be leaving after a little more than a year heading up the troupe. The Opera Garnier's management will be giving a statement to the press amid rumours that Milpied was frustrated with bureaucratic struggles within the ballet's strict hierarchy. He's also said to be considering a move back to the US with his wife, actress Natalie Portman. The dancer and choreographer came to international attention as the artistic force behind the 2009 film Black Swan, during which he met his wife. His nomination at the head of the Paris Opera Ballet was heralded as a breath of fresh air. Milpier himself had ambitious plans to revitalize the institution, as he told François Quatre in October of last year. Engage more interest to, to dance. Um, and also, very, very importantly, that you know, it's, uh, the dance and the arts are, are for everyone. It is to unite us, not, um, you know, so, so I long to see an audience that is really um, one that resembles Paris, you know, that is not elitist, but rather um, more, di you know, more diverse. And, and that also means the, the company also has to, has to be that way. Chinese artist Ai Weiwei has brought his artwork to Paris with a new exhibition at the Bon Marché department store. This comes as he sparked yet more controversy when he made a jab at European governments for their handling of the flux of refugees arriving in the EU. Ai Weiwei has recreated one of the most emblematic and disturbing images to emerge from the migrant crisis gripping the continent. Alexander Orcott and Yuka Roya have this report. It's an unsettling sight. Ai Weiwei lies limply on a beach, evoking the image of a dead Syrian toddler washed up on a Turkish beach that took the social media by storm last year. In recent months, the Chinese artist has been increasingly vocal about the plight of refugees. I think we can do a lot if we open our heart, if we understand philosophically what a refugee is about. You know, we, we all refugees as human in from some moment, some, you know, in the history. When Parliament in Denmark approved a new bill to strip asylum seekers of valuables last month, I shut down his exhibition there. The 58-year-old is one of the most rambunctious figures in the art world, never far from controversy, his dissident streak running through his wide range in works. In 1989, the artist showed support for students at Tiananmen Square by joining their hunger strike. Five years later, he went back to the same spot to take this picture. In front of the Forbidden City, a girl raises her skirt, turning her back to both Mao Zedong and two contemporary soldiers. In 1995, he came up with a performance called Dropping a Han Dynasty Urn. The smashing of the 1800-year-old artefact was seen as a way to denounce the Communist Party for destroying China's cultural heritage in the past. Despite this provocation, he managed to remain part of the art establishment in China, co-designing the Bird's Nest Stadium for the 2008 Olympics. Later that same year, a major earthquake in Sichuan province sparked public anger, as government corruption was blamed for poor construction of schools. While authorities were refusing to release the number of victims, Ai Weiwei spearheaded a movement to compile a list of over 5,000 names. In 2011, he was arrested and detained for three months, an experience he parodied in this video. At his latest exhibition in Paris, he has created sculptures of paper and bamboo. But if you look closely, there are hidden reminders of this difficult past. Here, one of the surveillance cameras that surrounded his home. A pair of handcuffs for his time in prison, and his passport that was confiscated by the authorities for three years until last summer. 
Ai Weiwei is a poet. He says things in a beautiful way. He uses art to send a message. And that's very strong. It's genius. Today, Ai Weiwei has left China and enjoys his freedom in Germany. But the dissident spirit hasn't left the artist. The Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame and the Champs Elysees. Everyone's familiar with the big hitters of Paris's tourist circuit. But what about the lesser known secret corners of the city? Specialist tour guides will now take you off the beaten path, behind closed doors, to unveil the unexpected, the offbeat and the quirkier sides of the city. It's all part of a three-day event called The Hidden Face of Paris. Our correspondents went in search of the curiosities hiding in plain sight. We begin our discoveries in the heart of the legendary Saint-Germain. For decades, this neighborhood has been a favorite haunt of artists and intellectuals. This was a meeting point for the existentialists, Juliette Gréco, Jean-Paul Sartre, Jacques Prévert. He lived on the top floor and used to threaten to jump whenever he'd had too much to drink. As we continue our guided stroll, every corner, every building has its own little-known anecdote. Yves Saint Laurent lived here for a few months when he first started his fashion house, all the way at the top with his muse, Lulu de la Falaise. They used to come here every Sunday afternoon with close friends to drink tea, eat cakes and go over the collection. This now respectable area has undergone something of a transformation. Half a century ago, it was a hotbed of sex, drugs and rock and roll. Jim Morrison was dragged out of here after an overdose, through that door there, near a club that used to be called the Rock and Roll Circus. A few decades earlier, Charles Baudelaire lived here, in the Hotel du Maroc, and even the great Picasso. On the other side of the river lies the hip neighborhood, Oberkampf. Hello, welcome to Baba Brewery. Follow me. The Hidden Face of Paris event offers a peek into some of the city's unusual treasures, like this brewery. Its young owners took over and remodeled a former button factory about a year ago. Four stories of modern metal structures, the makeover was hard to keep under wraps. We had three huge trailers carrying these vats that reached to the third floor of our neighbor's buildings. It was certainly unexpected for them. The people in this neighborhood weren't used to having artisan or industrial activity in their midst, and some of them asked some odd questions, like, is this some kind of nuclear plant or petrochemical industry? We had to explain a lot. But the mystery has only added to the brewery's success. I have to admit that the first time I came here, I couldn't find it. I had to call and have them come get me. But it's pretty cool to be a bit hidden away. Now Oberkampf bars and locals alike have to look no further than around the corner for a cold beer. Just another hidden gem in a city of surprises and possibilities. Well, Paris's Museum of Hunting and Nature may boast a classical, genteel facade, but inside the stately townhouse, a more savage type of beauty is on show at the moment. Painter Walton Fords, known for his large-scale watercolours of real and fabled animals, often depicted in violent scenes. His work's being displayed in Paris for the first time at the museum. François Quatre went to meet him. <laughs> It's a peek into the Jungle Book, or at least one man's vision of it. Life-size paintings of tigers, rhinos, and savage-looking snakes. The artist behind these wild canvases is Walton Ford, the 56-year-old American living out his childhood dream. The, the first things I ever drew or painted were animals, and I think that's true of a lot of children. I think they, they are, uh, are fascinated with animals, and I still get a great deal of thrill when I paint a big animal life-size. It does make me happy. <laughs> Among his favorite subjects are monkeys. He says the primates are often misunderstood, not appreciated in their natural state. So we look at them either as clowns or, or court jesters or uh, personifications of our own sins. They're, they're never allowed in our uh, world to just be monkeys. 
Ford treads a thin line between naturalism and fantasy. This is his vision of the beast of Givaudan, a man-eating creature that, according to legend, terrorized peasants in southern France in the 18th century. The painting was done specially for his Paris debut and stays true to the central theme of his work, the relation between man and beast. The thing that's still feared is this sort of irrational uh, nature inside of our heads, um, our fear of what we don't understand, and that's uh, the beast. A fear that's more a fascination for the artist and his many fans. This Australian visitor leaves with a unique autograph, that of a child enthralled by nature, now a man still passionate about the wild and its secrets. The world of graphic arts got a shake-up last month when Franco-Syrian cartoonist Riyad Satouf announced a boycott of the Angoulême Festival because there were no female artists nominated for the prizes. He'll be happy to hear then that an event taking place in London this week's just as one-sided, but in the opposite sense. Comic Creatrix showcases the work of 100 women responsible for graphic novels, comics and illustration. We'll leave you with some of those images. Remember, you can get more news on our website. We're also on Facebook and Twitter. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Revisited. Colombia, November 13th, 1985. The Nevado del Ruiz volcano erupted, melting the snow covering the summit. During the night, the river which runs past the town of Armero overflowed and turned into a huge avalanche of mud. More than 20,000 people were killed in their sleep. Following the disaster, thousands of families searched for the missing children. Hundreds still haven't given up. 236 families are still looking for their children who have probably been adopted abroad. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.